In earlier videos, we toured the largest private collection of aroids in the U.S. at the Missouri Botanical Garden with Emily Coletti, talked with botanist and aroid expert Dr. Tom Crowett, and toured the Climatron with botanist Monica Carlson, who studies scents of anthuriums. Now we asked Monica to take us through 10 standout plants that she enjoys, so these are some of her selects. I swear it's like an Easter egg hunt every time here. <laughs> yeah. There we go. So, oh, hopefully. Ah, oh, come on. No. It, it, was, it was smelling on Tuesday. Yeah. It smells in the morning. Okay. So it was kind of weird that yeah. it was smelling. Okay. So which one so, is this? So this little guy in here. Anturio fragantissimo, mm -hmm. right? Is from Panama originally. And of course, as the name says, fragrantissimo. It, fragrantissimo. Yeah. it smells Fragrant. super, super nice. Kind of like a flowery, sweet gardenia mm. kind of mm. a smell. I'm right gonna now, try that. Right nothing. now, mm, nothing. No. It tickled so, my nose and yeah. I got nothing. So um, the flowers are actually, when they're yellow, mm -hmm. that's when it starts like super, super smelling and attracting all the bees and everything that pollinates this guy. So this is kind of like one of my inspirations for the figuring out the anturion, how anturion smells in the wild. Mm. Because as, I, as we were talking about before, um, anturion, the one that you find in the stores, they don't smell. Nothing. And they look like plastic. Yes. So a lot of people are like, okay, those are not real things. Mm -hmm. But in the wild, there are a lot of really nice smelling anturions that we have, they haven't made it into cultivation. Right. They might be too hard to grow. They might be too hard to um, hybridize with something else that we have already in cultivation. So it's kind of hard to figure it out. But once we know which ones are the ones that smell nice, mm -hmm. we can start trial, right? Well, when I think about anthuriums, mm -hmm. like it falls into two camps, right? You have the flowers with the andrianums and maybe the antochiensis. And then mm -hmm. a lot of folks, though, mm -hmm. really are attracted to the foliage, the foliage. right? Yeah. Yes. So, you know, in some cases, you, you think those nary do those two meet, but in this case, you know, never have I seen a person say, I want to get an anthurium for the floral for scent. It, exactly. Because probably they haven't smelled it, yeah. you know? Like, they might go into a greenhouse or into their own collections mm -hmm. and they kind of catch a wind for it, mm -hmm. but they really don't know where it's coming from. Until you start, like, smelling everything that you see, yeah. that's when you realize, oh my goodness, these things smell super, super good. Is there anything else that's a defining characteristic, or can you tell us more about this uh, plant? I mean, I see, like, mm -hmm. somehow the petioles, like, come down, so maybe it's, like, trying to direct the water down towards it, or... Uh, tell me a bit more. Yeah, so there... So Two ideas. When the water falls on the leaf, mm -hmm. they're kind of like waxy looking. So you see like they're kind of like shiny looking, right? right? So the water on the leaf you don't want. Mm -hmm. So you kind of like have this pendant leaf that mm -hmm. droop the water all the way down into, mm -hmm. the, into the ground. When the water gets closer to the stem, then you want to direct them to the roots, right? right. To, so the little channel in here, which is definitely, that's what it's called. Mm -hmm. The little channel in here kind of directs more most of the moisture to the stem and into the roots. As well. Fascinating. So other thing, and I keep looking for those guys. Um, sometimes we see them, sometimes we don't see them. The little get glands. The little glands, yeah. yeah, but like, they're so hard to see. We saw some here in this grouping, uh -huh. this, uh, this section of plants, but yes. not all of them had it. I'm sure if you stick it under a microscope, exactly. you'd be able yes. to see Yes, some of them are super easy to see, like yeah. with the naked eyes. Yeah. Other ones you definitely need a microscope to see. But this whole section in here are plants that have those we call them plantations. We don't. We don't know if they are glands. We yeah. don't know if they are just holes that fill up with oil. Interesting. Like we really don't know a lot about what is in there. Yeah. Even, no. So it would be so nice to like figure out the chemistry behind it. And, That's oh, yeah. great. I mean, yeah. I, and, and you said this one smells a little bit like a. Uh, a like a sweet gardenia. Gardenia. Like okay. a gardenia, okay. yes. So um, there are a lot of like chemicals that can make up the smell, but like there is usually one or two that are more prominent. Mm -hmm. And that's what we associate with like flowers that we know, mm -hmm. like the roses, the gardenias, the jasmines, all of that. Um, it's, it's interesting, even in the ones that smell kind of uh, bad to our nose, 
they do have a touch of gardenias or jasmine on their tone. Mm. No, it's not. It's not completely uh, a repugnant smell. Yeah. But they also have like a sweetness into it. So that's definitely doing something to attract bees. And who's pollinating this? Bees, you said, primarily? So we are thinking they're bees, mm -hmm. right? Uh, we still have to study a lot more the pollinators in the wild because we don't know a lot of things. Mm -hmm. But that takes a lot more time because like, you might be there when the flower is smelling, but yeah. the pollinators are not around. Yeah. So you have to stick in the wild for like weeks or so you know, to try to catch the pollinators. Yeah. So the complement of the smell will be studying the insects mm -hmm. as well and figuring out what it is. But we assume, because they smell kind of like sweet orchids, that the same species that pollinate the orchids might also be attracted to the anthurions and pollinate the anthurions. Yeah, I think that's a sensible conclusion. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> the ones that smell kind of funky, yeah. we have definitely seen flies here in the greenhouses. Cockroaches. Flies and cockroaches, <laughs> yes. So, and they also tend to start smelling in the afternoon and towards the evening, yeah. whereas the nice smells are usually towards the morning. Mm. So that's when the bees are more active in the morning, and then like the whole suit of other insects that are active at night, those are the ones that are attracted to more um, stronger smells. Yeah, and I think that you just so, show so many nuances, like the time of day, mm -hmm. maybe even the color of the flower, mm -hmm. you know, what it smells like, and mm -hmm. then you could just make a hypothesis of what you think is actually pollinating. Exactly. Them. Yeah. And the other thought that actually one of our researchers here at the garden had long time ago when he was doing his PhD in the 70s was that um, Anturion, there are so many species of them. And he thought that, well, all these colors are different. They, t they flower at different times of the day. They have different smells. That's probably what is like driving this diversity. Mm -hmm. Each one of these species is kind of targeting a group or a, se or a separate species of insect. Mm -hmm. And that's how they can uh, partition right. like the whole forest right. community. Right? right. So that's where we have a thousand plus mm -hmm. a species of Anturium, probably up to 3,000 but very few of the other plants. Right, do you see that with orchids as well? Do yes, have, okay. orchids is the biggest uh, species diversity mm -hmm. in the whole world. So orchids and um, sunflowers, those are the top two groups, like the most species diversity. And we know for sure in orchids that they, they change the color of the flowers, the ch shape of the flowers, the smell of the flowers to target different mm -hmm. insect groups, for right. sure. All right, well, what's the next one? Uh -huh. Okay, so uh, let's go around this corner. Yep. Mm -hmm. Just easy. Okay. So, ba ba ba, where is my. Uh -huh. So, here in this corner of the greenhouse, we have the palmate group of Anturids, right? So, and you can see like there is like the common denominator is that the leaves looks like the palm of your hand. So that's why they're all palmates. So we got these, 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 growing up the tree, going over here. And, and there all, are- They all look like chaflaris. This especially yes, looks exactly, like a chaflaris. Exactly, yeah. So um, this group is currently under revision mm -hmm. because there is a lot of plasticity in how the, sh the leaves look like. So we're trying to understand actually how many species there are out there. And plasticity just means that they differ di differentiate at some exactly. point in their yeah, time. Exactly, yeah, exactly. So it means that the shape of the leaf can vary mm -hmm. between one individual and the other mm -hmm. one, even though they belong to the same species, mm -hmm. right? So you might have here like five different things, and then the next individual is the same species, but has only three. Right. Or doesn't have as pronounced of the uh, waviness mm -hmm. of the leaf, right? So we're trying to figure out based on DNA, mm -hmm. if this thing actually is, if it's actually different species or just individual differences mm -hmm. of the same species. There are two plants in here that are like the streams of what we're looking at. My little baby one is Anturium polychistum. And this is actually pretty common in cultivation. Yeah, and easy I have to this. Cultivate. I have this as a house Exactly, plant. exactly. Yeah. I just love it because it's the smallest mm -hmm. species in this huge group. And like just the waves on the leaf, they're just like so neat looking. Yeah. So one, one kind of puzzle that we have in here is that we actually have the type of specimen of this species. Like oh, really? the very first specimen that was collected for this. In the type of specimen, there is no wavy leaves at all. It looks just like this, but with a straight margins. 
And nobody has been able to find that kind of shape in the wild. Everybody finds the wavy one. That's really funny because I now I have to really look at the one that I have at uh -huh. home because this waviness is really pronounced. Uh -huh. And yes. I feel like mine's maybe a little less pronounced, but it's also growing in probably in a natural condition of a pot growing in a house. But, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So we are still trying to figure out, okay, is this really what the person that described the species originally thought it was? Right. Or this is the variation of it? And we just haven't found the, the unique, mm -hmm. uh, very first descri description with the linear, like no wavy leaves. So, so if you see some with non-wavy leaves mm -hmm. and wavy leaves, would it be a, a variation or a form of, or what would that's it That's overthinking. Okay. Yeah, that's overthinking. So if the general structure is the same, yeah. but only one thing differs, like yeah. it's wavy, it's not wavy, we could say, yes, it's a variety, okay. right? If there are three or more things that are different, mm -hmm. then we start thinking, okay, this is actually a different species. Okay. And we can prove that it is or not when we study the DNA mm -hmm. of, the, of the plants. So that's what we're trying to do. So this is my little baby. And then you have the big monster, which is Anturium clavigerum, right? It's also fairly common in cultivation. Yeah. It is really common in herbarium collections because yeah. as soon as you are in the forest and you see that thing, you're like, oh, I have to get that. <laughs> and people think it's like so strange. It's not. It's like super, super common. It's the most common thing that you can find. Right. It's just really weird looking. Yeah. So somehow this plant that is huge has the waves and it's just like, looks like a monster, like Monstera. Yeah. Uh, is somehow related to this tiny little baby in here, mm -hmm. right? So obviously, they grow in completely different habitats. So this one tends to be a little bit more of a like, tropical lowland rainforest habitat, mm -hmm. whereas the polychiston is more like a middle elevation cooler habitat. Are these climbers at all? Or, you yeah. know, this one I have in my house mm -hmm. seems to kind of trail and want to go somewhere. Exactly. Yeah. So this one tends to climb, but in the, in the low, in the on the ground, right. instead of climbing up. Right. And Clavigeron definitely climbing up. Oh, and that's yeah. just starting at the bottom, mm -hmm. and you can see that it's like, okay, I want to go higher, right? Right. right. <laughs> so, yeah. And I want to get bigger. Yeah, oh, yeah. totally. Yeah. Like, that is it's still a baby mm -hmm. uh, to what it's supposed to be. So these two of my plants, definitely in the Palme group, mm -hmm. are like the best, like they're just so weird, so unique. And I know that you um, study Anthurium scent. Is there anything that you, is unique about these flowers? So or? we have a smell a lot of these guys and actually we might be able to get, no. No. So this group actually is a group that smells bad. Oh, okay. So like, like dirty well, socks? Then, no, or? okay, so fermenting. Oh, so fermenting. When, yeah, okay. so you are fermenting a fruit, yeah. fermenting a banana. Yeah. That's how it smells like. Okay. And the flowers are not decaying. The flowers are fully open. They are exposing this, this, the, the pollen out, but they smell like they're fermenting, like alcohol fermenting. So you, that's when you get the flies. On them. Exactly. Yeah. That's ex like, and definitely, like in this kind of environment, you get a lot of the fruit flies mm -hmm. that you might get in garbage and around your house, that's what comes into the greenhouses mm -hmm. and pollinates this. Mm -hmm. So there is definitely, a, a, we think in Anturion, there is definitely a separation between the nice smelling flowers and the flowers that smell not so nice. Right. <laughs> right. Like, and there is, a, there is a scale on how nice and how not so nice, right. for sure. <laughs> yeah. Amazing. Yeah. What's next? So, okay. Direct so us. okay, so next one. Let me see. How do I get to that? Okay, so we can go around this okay. one. And we keep going one more. There we go. And then we're gonna go down there. Huh? And it's basically at the very end. But watch out with all the. <laughs> So we start from here mm -hmm. and we see like all the variation until we get up to this tiny little yes. guy, right? Which I love that one. Uh -huh. Yeah. So this is the genus. So to me, uh, it's, it's kind of hard to pick one species. Yeah. Uh, so sometimes I just pick, okay, I love this genus. Yes. Right? I, so, I'm the same way with Peperomia. I'm like, I love yeah, Peperomia. Oh, Peperomia so, are so yeah. cute. Yeah. yeah. Like, oh, they're so cute. <laughs> so this genus is Nephthitis. Yes. And is originally endemic to, uh, to Africa, right? So there are very few arrows in Africa. Mm. But the ones that are there are very unique. They are very weird, right? Uh, we don't know, like, historically, like, among millions of years, what happened to the arrow 
soils in Africa. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe it's too dry for them to thrive, or maybe they were there, and um, when it started to dry out, they started to go extinct, mm -hmm. right? But there are very few, but they are very, very unique. Mm -hmm. So we were looking um, in the Climatron at Anturions that kind of like look like that, yeah. like that shape. Yeah, we did see some. Uh -huh. is oh. this a, what is this? Anturion berrosavaliensis from Mexico. Uh -huh. So the Mexican group is the weird, it's one of the weirdest groups of Anturions. This looks like almost like a nephritis. Yes, yeah. yes, it does. And actually, super funny that you say it because the fruits yeah. are orange. Oh, they're orange Just too. like oh, nephritis would be. Oh my God. Exactly. Okay. Yes. Yeah. So it's like very nice, very nice eye. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So, but it's definitely Anturium flower, right? Yeah. The flowers yeah, are flower exactly so, the same. Yeah. yeah. So they're from Mexico. I love and, that shape though. That sh that. And one thing that we learned actually from crossing Anturios mm -hmm. is that the Mexican group kind of like crossed with each other really well, but it doesn't cross with anything else in South America or any, anywhere else. So they are their own little entity. Yeah. And when we started doing the DNA analysis, mm -hmm. They definitely come out as a very distinct, separate group, and they they also have the uh, orange mm -hmm. inflores, the orange fruits, right? So we're like, okay, is that the same thing or is it not the same thing? Right. Well, the clue is, and I actually found there we go uh, in the flowers. flowers. Okay, so we were talking about aeroids, mm -hmm. and there are basically two groups of aeroids: mm -hmm. the ones that have the female the the female flowers at the bottom like this, yep. and the male flowers at the top. So right. you can see two different regions of flowers. Mm -hmm. So you're only going to find pollen on the top, and this one is actually dropping some pollen in yeah. there, right? And you can have, find the fruits and the, male, and the female, female flowers yeah. at the bottom. So that is nephthitis. When we look at Anturium, all the flowers from the bottom to the top look the same mm -hmm. because they have both male and female parts together. Right. Right. Now, is this one... Would mm -hmm. this be cell fertile, or is this trying to, probably being fertile at one point and then the female is fertile at another point? Yes. Yeah, so okay. usually to avoid uh, crossing yourself, mm -hmm. because that tends to lead to another, a lot of genetic diseases, right? right? They shed the pollen at a different time than the bottom uh, is parts, the female parts mm -hmm. are resected, mm -hmm. right? So they can even be within the same day, mm -hmm. morning and afternoon, or within different days, like even within a week of separation. Mm -hmm. So most of the plants tend to be, um, tend to avoid that crossing, in this herself, crossing themselves yeah. by separating the sexes, right? Yeah. Separating them in the space and separating them in time as well. So what species do we have here? And do, uh -huh. they, do they span across a specific country or countries within Africa? Or uh, do we I, see this across the I think the most continent? of the ones that we have in here are from Gabon. Okay. Because they have a nice rainforest there. They have yeah. a nice rainforest. Yeah. And we at the garden had a really nice program in the early 90s in yeah. Gabon. Okay. So we had a lot of people collecting a species in the area. So which one do we have in there? Okay, so Poissoni. the Poissoni. Yeah. yeah. So this one is the same. So this one seems to be different. Af Afzelia. Afzelia. Yeah. Uh -huh, Afzelia. Afzelia, yeah. And then over here we have the same point, Sunny, but on the other side. That's the, the little, the one little bitty like a one. The little bitty one. right? Yeah, the little bitty one. Yes. So this one is from Ghana. So mm -hmm. this one we actually have the, the place where we collected it. And I find these to be pretty tough plants, actually. Yes. There's times where I forget to even water mine, mm -hmm. and it just kind of sits exactly. there in the back and puts well, out new leaves and puts out these little tiny flowers. Well, like, if you think about, like, Africa, Africa yeah. is a pretty tough continent in yeah, terms absolutely. of climate, right? Yeah. So if you are not tough enough mm -hmm. to make it in Africa, mm -hmm. you will not make it in a house, right. right? Right, So, yeah, like, African plants do very well when we forget about them yeah. in the house. Yeah, exactly. I just think they, they look like masks, which are, are yes. pretty cool. Cool. Oh, like, really neat. Yeah. This one is also F. Zellii. The shapes of them are just so, so cool. Almost like a superhero mask. <laughs> yeah, I love those. Oh, sorry. So yeah, so we have a smaller collection of African mm -hmm. things, mm -hmm. but they're, they're so unique. Like, I just, I just love seeing these things. And especially because I've never been to Africa, so I would love to oh, see those fantastic. things in a while. Yeah. <laughs> so let's go, let's go to another African okay. thing that I like. And it's this guy over here. 
So Ancomanis mm -hmm. is a pretty small genus, also from Africa, only two species, and I think we only have one of them in, in here in the collection. But if you want weird within a race, like, yeah, definitely Ancomanis is weird. It's got some daggers, it seems. It has those yeah. spines, like, all over, like, yeah. including the leaf. Like, you can see the underneath of the leaf has all those little spines. Like, the leaves are super dissected, right? There is a lot of little pieces in there. It has this really weird, kind of, like, climbing or, or like, uh, right like some It's like a corkscrew, really. Yeah, like it's like kind of like twisting itself, yeah, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, it, can, it can go, like, along the ground, or it can just start, like, to go up, but wow. it doesn't go all the way up, it turns to come down again. It so. reminds me of a very thick corkscrewed mangrove, in a way. Oh, yeah, yeah, I can definitely see that. Yeah. And other things that they have, so once again... So is this, like, a, is this a, uh -huh. related to the amorphophallus, or what is... Or? So, actually, I have no idea. Well, like, I'm trying to look in the, the following. Like, well, like uh, well, which, the, yeah, no. yeah. yeah, I have no idea why they it's, gave it that name. Uh, well, yeah, because I mean, because well, Bolwicha is that plant that, that just keeps yeah, growing the leaves exactly, out, and, and like it looks like nothing. It must be nothing. named after somebody or something. It looks something. like nothing to this, yeah. <laughs> like this. <laughs> yeah. So in this case, um, so once again, we have the different kinds of flowers types, right? The female flowers at the bottom, then we have the male flowers in here, and then we have this whole part that has no flowers at all. So. And one weird thing that doesn't happen a lot mm. in uh, plants in general is white fruits, right? Mm. We have zero idea what eats these fruits, what disperses these fruits. Uh, probably some sort of big mammal from Africa, for mm -hmm. sure, but we have no idea. But in general, like fruits in nature tend to be bright colors, so they get picked up, right? right. By birds, by monkeys, by whatever. White is not very common. Do you think it's white at night, like something at night that might see it? Not turnip pollinator, that might be yeah. interesting. Yeah. yeah. And that might be also why we haven't picked it up yet, because yeah. we tend to be in the forest in the day the daytime yeah. instead of at night. I just think about white mm -hmm. flowers at night with baths, white, you know, that yeah. kind of thing. And, yeah. you know, it's it's striking, especially in moonlight. In the contrast. Yeah, yeah. you'll be like able to see it. white against green or dark. Exactly. Yeah. These are quite picky, I have to say. I wanted to move this out of the way of, of Sonder. And, and they're like, ah! I got a little <laughs> stung, yeah. Yeah, so I just love them. Like, these are a lot of things that monocots, that mm -hmm. things that are related to grasses, are not supposed to, to do or to have. And in arrows, they do and they have them. It's so strange because it reminds me of like big anthurium berries and a morphophallus style, style stalk. Yep. And then this kind of weird corkscrew mangrovey kind <laughs> of look. It's just a- And kind of like the Lassia spines too, yeah. right? Because Lassia is another group of arrows that have spines. So it's like a mismatch of a lot of different things. Yeah, that I think about some it. animals though in Africa that are kind of like that, where it looks like it mm -hmm. has a, the body of a deer and the head of like something else, uh -huh. you know, so. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so African things are, are just amazing. Mm -hmm. Like, in general, the group, the few groups that do make it in Africa of mm -hmm. heroes, they're just amazing. Okay, so that was my African thing. Now, let me see. Okay, so there is one in this greenhouse across. On this side. Mm -hmm. uh, well, you can kind of see it, yeah. Okay. So... We were talking about pretty leaves, right? Um, this group of plants in general, uh, they are the anturions with three lobes, mm -hmm. right? Those two like, look like they're flying leaves, mm -hmm. right? Uh, I actually work on this group for my masters. And we discovered a few species. And this is the species that I like the most, Anturion rimbachiae, right? And I like it because when they're shedding the pollen, you can actually see the little stamens pushing completely out of the flower. 
That's something that is not very common in Anturion. In Anturion, you usually see like the stamens are right there. They don't mm -hmm. pull out. Mm -hmm. These can pull out up to like a quarter of an inch. Oh, wow. All the way out. Okay. Like, when they are full, you see like just spikies all over. Yeah. And those are the stamens. Those are the pollen grains just trying to push out of the plants. So right? the shape of the pollen grain is, is long, elongated in a way. So, no, the shape of the stamens. So Stamen, the part okay. that is carrying the pollen. Okay. The structure that is carrying the pollen. Right, okay. Uh huh. Yeah. So what we think is, uh, if you kind of like expose your pollen out there with the wind, it's easier to disperse it. And that's a way to like get your pollen into another area, mm -hmm. right? Instead of dropping it right here, right next to a plant that could be your sister, basically. So is it something that smells or not? Because sometimes when pollinated, it doesn't always smell. So this one on the other hand, it does smell. It's okay. very faint, so it's gonna turn yellow. So we're thinking maybe clue into some bees that mm -hmm. can be harvesting. And it will also make sense like if you're exposing all your, your yellow parts, mm -hmm. like the bees will catch it like, oh yeah, let's go to that flower, right? And pick it up. So it will work both ways in mm -hmm. this case. It's very faint the smell, but it mm -hmm. does smell. And like among the group of three loaves things, I think this one is the coolest because of the flower is so different, right. right? Is this the same one or is this different? Yeah, that's the same one, it's just the a baby. New, yeah, the new leaf. Yeah, the yeah. new leaf, Always the new nice baby to leaf. See the new yes, leaves. yes. So this is a different one in the same group. This is Anturion truncicola. Wow. It's just massive and beautiful. And then, so this one is from Ecuador, that one is also from Ecuador. And then we have this little guy in here from Costa Rica that also has the yellow spadix but it's a, a smaller leaf. So what we figured out is that um, although they all have exact uh, variations on the theme of having three lots, they are not closely related to each other. Interesting. But, yes, so we are trying to figure out exactly where they're going into the like whole picture of relationships in Anturium, but we know they don't make a whole, a group together. Is there some benefit that you would see, mm -hmm. morphologically speaking, of three-lobed plants? Since we haven't yet. Okay. We haven't yet, no. So we have no idea how they evolve, how they came about. Um, we have no idea why they do it. Mm -hmm. So it's just a very weird uh, a, a structure, I guess. Uh, in terms of cultivation, not, not a lot of these guys are in cultivation. And our theory is that they tend to be really picky with uh, humidity conditions. They like to be in humidity all the time. I mean, we're in kind of a, a warm, humid environment exactly, right now. Exactly, yeah. yeah. And this particular house, we call it the mist house mm -hmm. because it tends to have more humidity than the other greenhouses around. So they definitely like it better in here. When it gets too hot, it's a little bit of a challenge. So it's, they're, they're harder in cultivation, mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. sure. Yeah, we're still trying to figure out where they're going in terms of the whole picture of Antonio. Yeah, yeah. yeah. so this, this whole group is gonna be something that gets rejiggered, you think? Or? Yes, yeah. so originally, when I was doing my master's, mm -hmm. um, it's called Semiophilium. Uh, now it's gonna be splitting probably four or five different things. Wow, okay. Mm -hmm. A lot of movement. A lot of movement, yeah. yes. <laughs> so that's like in Anthurion in general, when you see leaves, they do not relate to each other. Like they can be completely different groups of species in different geographies, mm -hmm. different habitats, and they have exactly the same thing. What are the characteristics that you're often looking for in order to be able to differentiate the Anthurium mm -hmm. if you're not using, let's say, genetics um, obviously, floral structure will have something to do with it. Is there any other sterile characteristics that you could use in order to identify them? Yes, so if you want to separate a species mm -hmm. of Anthurium, you look at the venation pattern. That is super unique and different in the species. Like, uh, most species of Anthuriums have this collective vein, like runs along the margin of the leaves. How spaced out is that from the margin is a character. How many of these primary veins is a character to differentiate a species? How many of these basal veins are there? So the venation pattern can tell a species apart super, super easy. More than the shapes, right? Uh, when we're trying to group together a species of Anturium, then we look at the flowers and the fruits. 
those are the clues that tell us these things are related to each other. But we are trying to split them apart and figure it out, like the total diversity mm -hmm. of Anturians, Venetian patterns for sure. That's Good. great, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, so the other one, it might be just easy to go out mm -hmm. that way. So in here, uh, the first thing we're gonna do is the smell. Okay, let's see. Ooh, it smells like um, carrots. It smells like a crisp carrot to me. Uh-huh, that's interesting. Yeah, huh. that's why you, and you should never tell me what it smells like. Oh my goodness, I don't get carrots at all. I you get, don't? I get okay. like jasmine kind of really? a smell. That is so funny. Oh wait, I do smell a little jasmine now though. Because I just told you. I know, I know, that's the it's problem. It's so bad, it's so bad. I smelled carrots at first. Sonner, what did you smell? What do you smell? Yeah, it's got some carrot. <laughs> carrot vibes. I'm from the Netherlands, so carrots. Carrots vibes, okay. <laughs> but, so, you know, you, you just told me that. I know, like carrots, I know. So that, that's a, that's an, an acrystallinum, which is uh, what most people know, you know. Yeah. So, I don't I know if they've you ever most people ha have never not a smell. smell. Yeah. Have not a smell. The flower. I definitely get carrot vibes in there still, but I do get a little floral scent too. You know? I, I came in and I like I saw it like, oh, this must be smelling. I'm, oh, yeah, I am, is smelling. I'm committed to my carrot scent. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, oh, this one is not smelling. It's too young to be smelling right now. So, oh, there we go. Yeah, too young to be smelling right now. Yeah. So. This guy, if he was smelling, it would mm -hmm. smell like, uh, do you know the, the cleaner pine salt? Oh yeah, okay. that's pretty intense. Okay, yeah. that's the smell of this okay. guy. <laughs> that's interesting that that one's pine salt. So this one, I'm yeah. gonna show you the name of it. There's a little um, anthurium ochrathum. Ochrathum. Uh-huh. There's also a little jump spider in here who is just like kind of oh, jumping around. <laughs> it's like, oh, that's so cute. Oh yeah, there yeah. you go. <laughs> I'm missing two things, and those two are one that is super common mm -hmm. if you are in the temperate hemisphere, mm -hmm. which is the skunk cabbage. Yes, skunk the cabbage. Uh -huh. I see a lot in my neighborhood. Exactly. Yeah. 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 So uh, when I was when I was living in DC, we had it like right there in the Maryland, Virginia area. I love it because of two things: because of the smell, mm -hmm. of course and because of what it does to make sure that the flower stays alive and is visible, mm -hmm. right? So it smells like a skunk, it mm -hmm. smells super bad. But the cool thing is that, and it's something that happens in very few aeroids, it heats up the inflorescence to go through the snow <laughs> and actually push that flower out. Yeah. It's like, how on earth do you do that? You're a tiny little thing like this big and you heat up enough to melt a snow. Exactly. That's just amazing. Yeah. Like, I yeah. recently went on a tour mm -hmm. of a guy who was growing shiitakes and I was mm -hmm. like, oh my God, he had so many skunk cabbage. Mm -hmm. And he's like, oh, I planted it all as a joke. Uh -huh. But it just comes up because it, it loves these little wet, swampy wet. areas. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. I know, I just like, I've seen pictures. I've never seen it like in the snow, Yeah. but I've seen pictures of it and you can see like the whole little ring around the inflorescence that just melt the snow and like just needed to flower and decided that's what I'm gonna do it. Yeah. Just like, oh, I love That's definitely one we're gonna grow on our land because uh -huh. he, even he's like, do you want us to transplant some? It uh -huh. should be actually growing on our land in some of the wet areas, yeah, but it ha hasn't is. been, it might be, but I hadn't seen it before, mm -hmm. so. Yeah, it, pro it probably. Funny. Yeah. Because sometimes it doesn't come up, uh, yeah, sometimes it doesn't come up all the time, every year. Right, yeah. So you might miss it for a couple of years, but it's still there. It was a good year for skunk cabbage uh, this year, I have no, to say. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And the last plant that I have is Anturium van der Napi. Oh, okay. Have you heard about that one? No. Okay. So Colombian species okay. is named after one of the founders of Anzura in ne the Netherlands. I was going to say it's a Dutch uh, name. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, it's actually, think about an Anturium andrianum yeah. in miniature. The flower is about this big. Okay. Exactly the same shape and colors of an Anturium andrianum. Are they in the same group? We don't know yet. Okay. So I just got DNA from uh, Lancy Botanical Garden in France yeah. to figure out. 
<gasps> if they are or not. Interesting. So is this so, a newly discovered species? Or so is it's something not. Okay. Like it was discovered like in the early 2000s. Okay. But it hasn't made it into cultivation. Mm -hmm. I there are a few people in Colombia that have it and have it cultivated in their gardens, mm -hmm. but I don't think they're selling it. It's hard to imagine that it was named or discovered at, like with a guy who was Dutch who found it in Thura and it hadn't made it into cultivation yet. <laughs> yes, it, yeah, it haven't made it there, yeah, like to Antura, yeah, right? Yeah, it's exactly. like, okay, you found And because he was one of the people in the, co in the collecting team that the very first time they yeah, saw it. I know? see. So uh, one thing that is kind of unusual about it is that it has those gland glands or plantations under okay, the leaf. Okay. And in general, that group has been really hard to make hybrids with. There is something chemically about that group that we don't know about, mm -hmm. and it's kind of like preventing hybrids with other groups of Anthurians. Interesting. So that might be a clue into yeah. why he hasn't made it into He hasn't into broke the Anthurium code. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> so um, I don't even know if they have any cultivation there in Anthura. Yeah. I've seen it growing in Colombia, in a lot of gardens in Colombia. That's so it seems to be doing pretty well. And it's a little it. miniature one, no matter yeah. where. It's okay. a little miniature one, and it tends to like crawl around the the floor, the, the ground. Yeah. So it's kind of so like, like a ground cover. Like almost. a ground cover. Yeah, yeah exactly. Uh, but the flowers, they're just like, oh, this is a baby and piano. It's so cute. <laughs> I was like, yeah, my favorite one. Stay tuned on Plant One On Me for more botanical tours, talks, and how to's. And if you're looking to further your knowledge on the plant kingdom, then have a look at our various online courses from Troubleshoot Your House Plants to the House Plant Masterclass. Additionally, we have a second channel we started last year called Flock Finger Lakes, where we cover more on outdoor gardening, habitat restoration, agroforestry, and even more. So check that out if that interests you. Otherwise, we'll see you in the next episode.